<clears throat> All right, so I thought we'd look at a couple more of these uh, gene systems. There's many thousands of them we could look at, but uh, this is one that uh, I think is interesting. Uh, this one relates to things like uh, post-traumatic shock disorder um, that can occur from a number of different things. Uh, people that are in uh, military situations, people that are in, in have uh, life accidents, uh, traffic accidents, Various things can can you know uh, be traumatic. Uh, certainly, abuse, uh, abusive situations can be part of that. Um, and this is a big question that comes up, particularly uh, when we look at individuals that have been uh, uh, in similar situations, maybe uh, a military uh, or other situations where they've had uh, adult trauma, and they they respond very differently to the same situation. Uh, some of them. Uh, have, you know, can have, deal with it and, and don't seem to have any long-term uh, negative effects. Other individuals, uh, I mean, and there's a spectrum. Other individuals can be extremely on the other end of the spectrum and, and exhibit very strong uh, post-traumatic shock outcomes. Well, you complete, you know, uh, life modifying and, and functioning uh, impacts. And there's lots of things in between, you know, just some people just have bad dreams. Some people have all sorts of, of events that can affect them. Um, and so the question has been, okay, we've got this variation. What, uh, is there a genetic relationship in this? Is it purely environmental? Is there a genetic relationship? And it turns out that there is for some individuals a genetic relationship and it has to do with what's known as the, the uh, FKB, FKPB5 gene. Um, this is a gene that's found on chromosome six. Um, interestingly, it's found in, in a region here um, that's, that's fairly close uh, to that um, C4A gene that we talked about in an earlier lecture. Um, but it, it's found right in that same little gene region on chromosome six. Um, here's an example of it. And this is the transcriptional side showing that it works this way. Remember that, um, you know, since we have Watson Crick, uh, strands that sometimes it's the Watson crayon, sometimes it's the Crick strand that uh, leads to having a um, the, the transcription occur. And so this, and, and sometimes those genes, <laughs> oh boy, excuse me, sometimes those genes overlap. Okay. Um, and so this is one example. This one gene has uh, 11 different exons. What's interesting about it is that there's uh, three exons on the front. Uh, any of which can become exon number one. Uh, the true exon number one can be moved over here. Exon number two can be the first exon. So we can skip this one uh, and skip this, this other one. And we can, we can move back and forth between these to, to, to be whichever exon um, that can occur. So there are different forms that can be, and these are again, mostly post-transcriptionally um, modified as to which one of these exons is actually used to give a, variation, a variant. This gene has a, a number of functions, but the one we're interested in has to do with um, its its function as um, a, a, like an adapter protein um, to help um, some signaling. And that signaling is primarily by cortisol and the cortisol receptors. And when that cortisol receptors um, function, what part of its function is then to go through NF kappa B, which it, once it's phosphorylated can move into the nucleus and can become a transcription factor, okay? Uh, and lead to, you know, transcription form. So it plays a role by, by basically being there to sort of help intercept uh, these, uh, these cortisol and not only intercept it, but also help in the regulatory uh, display of it, whether, you know, expression of it, uh, regulation and, and use of it. Um, now, just cortisol, remember, is out of the adrenal gland found on the kidneys. Uh, it's, it's, our, it's, it's known as our stress uh, signal, right? Uh, if we get into a really stressful situation or, or something scares us or something, our cortisol levels will go up, our heart rate will go up, we respond um, various ways with uh, muscle tension and things. Um, and then, you know, once the threat is over, those, those levels tend to, to go back down, right? Um, and so it, it, you know, signals not only our, our muscles and other things, heart rate and things, but it does it through primarily working through the neural system, through the brain, right? And there's this, there, there are these, uh, these uh, gonococcoid receptors that pick up these, this cortisol 
And that is related into this, this particular gene that we're talking about, the protein there, um, and, uh, the functioning of that gene. Uh, when things go wrong, when you have hypercorticoidism, um, the load is too high, uh, you end up with things like Cushing's disease, right? Uh, where the, uh, the manifestations of that are, uh, you know, weight gain, um, and stress, and all sorts of things, okay? Now, this particular gene itself is, is methylated, okay? Uh, and it has these methyl high methylation spots that occur on it. And it turns out that those methylation spots, exercise, diet, and stress uh, play a role in whether those get methylated and what the outcomes are. And depending on what the outcomes are, you may see things like increased uh, LDL and uh, levels. Uh, you may see cardiovascular things. It, it plays a role in lots of different things uh, outside of uh, its primary job up here or one of the big jobs uh, in the neural systems. Okay? So here's kind of looking at that. Right? One of the things they found, again, we're going back to this, this post-traumatic shock uh, outcomes. Uh, what causes the variation? And one of the things is it appears to be early life stress, okay? Either through early life abuse, uh, through nutrition, through lots of different things that can, that can lead to stress. Um, but what, does, what the, um, the main point is, is that in normal systems, okay, so this, this little line right here represents the, the expression level of this particular protein, okay? Um, er, early on, right, it, for birth, birth parturition, there's a, a spike in it. Uh, then it tends to decrease, and then it moves back up as we become adults, okay? And we, we need a kind of a, a no, normal level of it, okay? All right, what happens is that if you have early life stress, okay, you prime the system. That's what they really found out. That's what they're calling it. It's primed by the fact that you demethylate some of these control regions for this particular system, okay? Uh, and, and well, in the system itself, and, and as the exons, some of these repeat regions, um, they get methylated or unmethylated. Normally, they're fully methylated, okay? That's a normal outcome, right? Uh, and when stress hits that, you, they, they, you get gene expression. In the cases where they are, where they, there are spots that get unmethylated, demethylated, um, it causes overexpression of this particular protein. Okay. Now, what does those methylations happen? Is if there's an early life stress, apparently we can prime it by uh, demethylating these sites. Okay. Uh, as we move along over time, uh, this epigenetic regulation, you know, if we get cortisol in there, or we get a, you know, a feedback, uh, okay, um, or a negative feedback system. And what I mean by negative feedback is if oh, you're scared, you get a cortisol, you know, or something, you're having to run through, something's chasing you through the woods or whatever happens, or you're in a stressful situation. Uh, you, you tense, you get this. Um, but then slowly that's brought back down. The cortisol levels are brought down to normal by this negative feedback system. Uh, for these individuals that have these, this demethylation, you get a positive feedback and it pairs it so that the cortisol either doesn't decrease or that the, the feedback system saying, don't send any more down, don't do any more of this, uh, doesn't work, okay? Uh, and then as a time, you see a real break in these two. So individuals that have normal childhood stress or, or have methylation levels at whatever the system there, tend to have a, a level that builds up and, and through life, through adulthood, and restraints there. Individuals that have had early life stress can have um, abnormal response, okay, altered pathways, and they tend to have this, this heightened uh, overexpression of, of this, this cortisol, okay. Um, and these, of course, lead to pleiotropic symptoms, right, pleiotropic outcomes. Too much of it um, and too much cortisol leads to these uh, both uh, neurological outcomes, okay, uh, as well as uh, you know, heart and uh, things that are dealing with the epithelial outcomes that you saw earlier, et cetera. Right. So uh, if you're here, okay, so your, your early childhood stress comes along, okay, uh, or you have not, and you get into a stressful situation as an adult, uh, you may affect this heightened 
uh, developmental trajectory here or this, this you know, less items you may end up with. This could contribute to this outcome that you see, right? Um, so basically, early life stress decreases the methylation, okay? Uh, increases the lifetime expression, right, over time because it, it doesn't downregulate like it should. This leads to an overexpression of these, of these corticosteroid receptors, okay? And so what happens is once you have an adult event, okay, you end up with an impaired negative feedback. If you have regular feedback, right, there's, there's protection here. Uh, the system says, oh, okay, um, yeah, it happened, we get it, but we're going to feed back and say, okay, that's enough, I, we've responded, etc. cetera. Um, if you have an impaired system, it doesn't respond properly. Uh, it puts out too much of the, of the product because the promoter is, is functioning here, so you've got this upload, and you end up with a, a basically resistance to it. So it gets worse and worse and worse over time because you build up uh, this, this resistance to it. And so we, we see this from, so these individuals uh, have a higher risk. It's not a direct relationship. But they have a higher risk to, to psychotic disorders, particularly post-traumatic uh, stress type, uh, you know, pathologies. So it's one of those interesting ones. And it has to do again with this, the target transcriptome um, not being a properly done, the transfer system not working. So the body's doing what it should. Uh, it's just that it's not responding to those, those uh, at least adrenal gland outputs that you would expect to see. So we get an overexpression and we end up with this, with this problem, okay? Um, now, one of the interesting things about it is if we think about this, uh, does it do any good to, to do therapy and things like that? And there's been some studies out, and this is just one example, um, where, um, Therapy for post-traumatic shock and for other stress, life stressors. Um, and it turns out that individuals who have uh, low levels of methylation, all right, so they have this lifetime low levels. That's the, that's the individuals down here in the, in the sort of the gray ones, okay? They have, uh, they have uh, change in methylation, okay? Um, they tend to be lack responders, okay? If you can take individuals and methylate them, okay, and these are just particular sites, okay, this chromosome six sites, and this is another, this is just the average over here. But if you can, but individuals that have greater methylation, okay, they will in fact respond. So this is this is a uh, the idea here is that you could uh, methylate, cause you know, with, with diet or other approaches, and those individuals then would be a like more likely to respond to uh, intervention from a, you know, uh, from a, a psychiatrist or from a sociologist or something else uh, to sort of alleviate some of these issues. Individuals that um, don't have this change, okay, that are they're low methylation anyway, uh, they're not, and you don't change them, are, are not going to respond well uh, to the system, right? And then the last slide here is really just there, we, there are some known risk alleles, okay? Uh, and these are the locations of those risk alleles. And the risk allele is for the first location is about as a C, uh, the genotype is AC, et cetera. Um, so you see the, the relationships here. Um, and why this is important is that obviously we're starting to do uh, whole genome sequencing, we're starting it, we're doing it, but starting to see it as a, as a potential for everybody. Um, and one of the things, you know, that you might want to know if you say, okay, um, I'm trying, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a psychiatrist, I'm trying to treat this individual uh, for post-traumatic tract for whatever it may have been, you know, it may have been uh, early childhood event, it may be abuse, could be all sorts of things. Um, well, maybe, the, maybe some of them are going to respond and some aren't in different ways. If I know their genotypes, that may be able to allow me to develop a different treatment system. Uh, or it may be that the pharmaceutical, the, the therapeutics, uh, maybe a different way to do it. So we have, you know, uh, these, these really interesting uh, uh, things, and there's already some information out there uh, about the genotypes and then targeting, you know, the, how the treatment is related to those genotypes uh, in these forms. And again, it won't solve all of it. It's just a, it's a start, and it may take, help take care of some individuals. All right. Well, that's uh, that. The last one of these I want to talk about is the uh, MAO A and B system and, and how that works. 
and some of the things that have been related to that. This is the warrior gene. So that'll be in the next um, lecture that we do.